Welcome everyone to Tipping Points, where we ask key questions about how we can balance conservation and development. This webinar series is an initiative by Oppenheimer Generations Research and Conservation, and webinars usually take place on the last Thursday of each month at 1 p.m. My name is Pumla Lamini, and I'm a research associate at Oppenheimer Generations Research and Conservation, where my portfolio consists of coordinating research on some of OGRC's research centers, as well as supporting science communication and PR. I have a background in freshwater ecology and completed my MSc degree in ecological sciences at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, today, in honor of Youth Month, the focus of today's webinar is exploring how we can engage youth in environmental topics, um, and, or in other words, how we can make young blood run green. I'm glad to be with you today and look forward to a productive and insightful discussion. Please be aware that the session is being recorded um, and will be available on the Oppenheimer Generations Research and Conservation YouTube channel. This is also where you can catch up on any past webinars that you may have missed. I'd also like to encourage you to sign up to our OGRC quarterly newsletter um, and also stay tuned to OGRC's social media channels so you don't miss um, any upcoming webinars or important announcements. We're excited to have such a wonderful turnout today. Please continue to introduce yourselves in the chat box um, and don't hesitate to drop any questions you may have throughout the webinar. For today's webinar, I'm pleased to introduce you to our lovely panel of experts. Um, and in no particular order, I'd like to introduce you to Odile Ngadimeng. Odile Ngadimeng is a published author and a first year university student as well as a leader, a lead organizer of Fridays for Future South Africa. He is also the co-founder of the Sundown Movement, which is a climate network that connects high school students to take action um, in climate change as a collective. In addition to his role as a climate activist, Ngadi Meng is also the executive director of a youth voting advocacy group called So We Vote. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Eliza LaRue. Eliza is a professor in zoology at the University of Free State Squaqua campus, where she leads the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences as assistant dean, and she currently supervises five postgraduate students. Eliza's research focus is behavioral flexibility in small mammals, and she actively experiments with different teaching techniques. Eliza is an alumna of the South African Young Academy of Science, as well as the Africa Science Leadership Program. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Zama Ngomane. Zama is a dedicated wildlife management professional and the current national coordinator of the Jane Goodall Institute Roots and Shoots Community and Youth Development Program. Zama graduated in 2022 in wildlife management, bringing expertise in both extensive and intensive wildlife management systems to the role. With a passion for herpetology, Zama has been an avid wildlife reptile breeder and keeper for over a decade and a half, combining personal enthusiasm with professional commitment to wildlife conservation and education. As a national coordinator, Zama leads initiatives that empower young people to take position to take positive action, sorry, for animals, people, and the environment, fostering a new generation of environmental stewards. Zama's blend of academic knowledge, practical experience, and community engagement makes him a valuable voice in discussions on wildlife management and youth-led environmental initiatives. So we have a fantastic panel today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I would like to now invite each panelist to start off today's discussion by giving us some insights on the topic based on their background and their experiences. And I'd like to invite um, Odile and Karimeng to please start us off. Thank you so much for that introduction, Pumla. And thank you to everyone for joining this Tipping Points conversation. So I think, I'd start with just saying what we all know. We need a lot more young people in the space of climate activism, environmental conservation. 
We need more young people feeling engaged and more young people being part of the process of helping to safeguard our planet and safeguard all of the precious ecosystems that currently exist on Earth for many more generations to come. And so right now, the space in which we operate, I mean, I can speak only from the activism space, is that we're facing a lot of headwinds. Partly, it's that there's a lot of disinterest in this space amongst a broader part of society. Not a lot of young people have had the necessary level of engagement with issues such as climate change and environmental conservation that is sufficient enough for them to have a very real understanding of the crisis that is currently unfolding. So what do we do? So we at Fridays for Future have cultivated a space that one allows young people who maybe are understanding this problem to come together and to formulate a series of ideas, projects, anything that they want to implement, but want to do it within a network or within a much larger group of other climate conscious young people. Fridays for Future serves as a platform or a basis for them to organize, to speak about these issues, to help conscientize the public and their peers so that we can ultimately mobilize lots of young people to take action on issues surrounding to climate and environmental conservation. The Sundial Movement has and still is a network of schools that allows school students to engage on climate change and environmental conservation on their level. You know, one of the biggest headwinds we face in the environmental space is the very complex and nuanced language that exists around climate change. You know, you find that there are young people who are interested but are unable to find out, you know, or to think where should we start to understand what is the actual scope of the problem? Because the language that is used in policy documents or in descriptive reports of the crisis that's unfolding, that language is totally inaccessible to them. And I just like to add, you know, if it's inaccessible to people who are already in education, who should be learning these things then imagine what it's like to broader society that has long exited formal education. We need to break down those barriers. And those are areas where we should really be focusing. That is a key part of helping to get more young people involved. How do we break down the barrier between them accessing the knowledge that allows them to understand the scope of the problem? And if they understand the scope of the problem, they're then able to take action. I'm an example of that. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we face at Fridays for Future and at the Sundown Movement is that we have a group, a very large group of young people who really, really want to participate in finding solutions to South Africa's climate and ecological problem. But they're constantly being met with gatekeeping within the space of policy and within the space of environmental activism, believe it or not. There's a significant amount of gatekeeping. So we need to break down these barriers. We need to break down these gates, if I can use that expression. Because I feel that spaces that, spaces that exist to discuss issues of climate, issues of environmental conservation, issues that impact young people's future should inherently be open. And they should be open so that young people are able to engage in them, regardless of what level they're at in their understanding of this, of this crisis and their scope. Because the feedback that we seek to get from young people, at least this is from my experience within the policy space, is that we want to get experience, we want to get insight from young people that is directly attached to their lived experiences. Because that is where, that is the basis on which we develop policies, that is the basis on which we develop solutions. And so, and I'm cognizant of time here, but so as, as, as we continue in the space of climate change, finding solutions to the climate crisis, as we continue to engage with young people, we should look at how do we make the space one more open? How do we break down the barriers that young people currently face? Two, how do we capacitate youth organizations like Fridays for Future and Sundar to go further with the work that they're doing? You know, because we're trying to bring more young people into the space. But one of the headwinds, again, that I'd like to raise is that, you know, there's a lot of hindrances from the standpoint of resources. And this isn't just exclusive to youth organizations. It's across the climate. It's across the nonprofit space in South Africa. So that's another headwind that we need to begin to deal with. I think that if we can successfully merge information with networks that are open and networks that are accessible with added to that well-resourced organizations that exist to help mobilize at a grassroots level young people, I think that we can really have a powerful uh, formulation of 
organizations, individuals, and structures that can help to turn young people's blood green. And all of that matched at this specific time, right now in South Africa, post-election, when people are still keeping their eyes on the ball and people are still keeping their eyes on important issues. I think that we can really go a long way and set the climate movement further, probably by what it would have needed 10 to 15 years to reach at its current pace. And so that's just my initial insights. And I look forward to engaging with all of my fellow panelists. Thank you, Karimeng. Thank you for those, um, sorry, Otile, for those um, insights. I think you've raised some very, very good points about needing to be conscientious about breaking down the barriers that exclude and um, gatekeep the youth out of these important discussions. Um, up next, I'd like to welcome Eliza LaRue. Um, please take us away, Eliza, thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, and I agree with a lot of the points that Celia made there, but of course I come from the perspective of being a professor teaching at a university. So um, I teach animal behavior to undergraduate and postgraduate students. And um, when I started teaching, I didn't want to teach the way that I was always taught because frankly, I found it boring. And I remember never there was a certain class that I never attended class because it was easier for me to um, uh, just go to the textbook. I got 90% for the class, for the, for the course. Um, I'm a super nerd, uh, but I didn't want to... <laughs> I didn't want to repeat that. And uh, when we start, when I started, and, and now especially with AI and everything being uh, out there, uh, the question is always, oh, what are we offering that YouTube can't offer or that ChatGPT can't offer? Um, and frankly, we need to think about that in university spaces, which is where we have these students with all the potential to be uh, fired up for the client, for climate, fired up for uh, wildlife. Um, and we need to do this by sparking curiosity. I do, I love techno technology. I do not think technology is the way to do that. And uh, what the reason that I'm studying animal behavior, for example, is not just intellectual curiosity. I was always mm, wondering uh, why do animals use so few words to say what takes us entire Speeches. I mean, a baboon can give a wow. and say a lot. Everybody in the immediate vicinity will know exactly who said what and what to watch out for now. And we need to give, you know, hour long addresses wearing tuxedos and whatnot. So that was inspired maybe slightly by watching David Attenborough and so on. But it was mostly inspired by getting out there, being out there in nature. Uh, things going wrong. I loved hiking because I still remember when I was eight years old and a snake slithered across my foot. And, you know, I nearly died of fright. Nothing bad happened. But the, the things that went wrong, the experience is what fired me up and got me excited. And it's the same still, despite the fact that this is the digital age, supposedly. It is, it is the connection you need to form with nature that is going to uh, spark your interest and your passion for it. Um, and at universities, it's actually not so hard to do, but I know myself as well as quite a few other uh, colleagues, it is, uh, it's easier to just do the PowerPoint presentations and get through the, the material that you've got to cover and then, you know, maybe run an experiment or two during the practical uh, sessions. Uh, I dare people to do what they call teaching naked. And no, it is not actually teaching naked, but it sure feels like it. Uh, there is this approach called the flipped classroom. And some people call it teaching naked because you are totally vulnerable. You take the podium away from yourself and you are exposed. Um, because all of the basic background information that students need to get on the topic, those boring things that are on PowerPoint slides, you can put that online, which students cannot go online now and read through those slides or watch a five minute video that you made of that slide. They can do that and they will. And then in your class time, you do the complex things, you struggle with 
uh, uh, case studies, things like that. You take students out to the field to show them, oh, how do we collect this kind of data? Let's use something that's in our backyard. Oh, let's use ants. Let's use mice that are running around. Let's use the cats that are infesting our, our campus at the moment, sorry. But the practical stuff, the hands-on stuff, I make my students play games in class, and I don't know if they always appreciate it, but they are certainly very active in my class. Um, and I do think they remember it mostly because I end up somehow embarrassing myself <laughs> because you do leave open the space for things to go wrong. You take them out to the field. This is where they will understand the difference between what a horse is going to do when you approach them or stand there staring at them versus what a wildebeest is going to do. They're going to understand what the snort means. And the snort is not something you're going to come across when you just drive through the park uh, on the way to work or school or whatever. Um, and for me, this is something that we are sometimes a little bit leery of because things go wrong. My students this year got chased by the horses, not the willoughbys. Uh, but, but they brought that up multiple times in discussions afterwards. And I am pretty sure that at least a few of them will remember this for a long time to come. Um, and this, this I think, is, uh, yes, we make mistakes if we um, encourage things to be exposed like this, encourage students to go to the field. You take them to the field. You don't know what questions they're going to ask you. You don't know what unexpected weather events are going to occur, things like that. But this is exactly what YouTube doesn't offer. This is exactly what ChatGPT cannot tell you about. You are going to wander around and then suddenly realize, oh, it's the people that are around here that make more of an impact on, say, the grassland quality than the wildlife, for example. You're only going to know that and see that if you've walked in the grassland, if you, you've smelled it, if you've heard the noises and everything. Um, so for me, that remains the most important thing in this age of technology. Use technology for the boring stuff. You know where people say, oh, I wish chat or AI could be doing the dishes for me and giving me time to be creative and rather do art and writing. But what is AI doing? It's doing the art and the writing at the moment instead of the dishes. We, we can actually make AI do the proverbial dishes and get the, the boring, one of the most stuff across to students. Yeah, tick the little box, the little, um, you know how we get addicted to social media, we get addicted to our phones. I mean, my phone is right here next to me right now. Uh, we get a rush out of that. So sure, let's just acknowledge it. Students will also get that rush. Let's give them that rush a little bit and then take them out there, expose them to mother nature in her glory repeatedly, even in our own backyards during COVID we did studies on moths because every student was in a different part of the country and we could look at moth behavior at home. Um, we can do this. Um, technology do the, does the boring stuff. We do the exciting, risky stuff. And if we take that risk, that's how we get them maybe hooked on something new. And I think this is how we can, you know, hook quite a few more young people for nature. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Liza. Um, yeah, I think those are some really interesting points. And unfortunately, the opportunity to learn in the outdoors um, is becoming, you know, less and less attainable for, for people. And that's sad, especially for the future environmentalists and conservationists. So, yeah, it's very important. And it's funny, the horse story, because I myself had a horse encounter in a second year excursion. So that's funny. Um, Anyway, I'd like to welcome Zama Ngomane um, to give us his insights, please. Thanks, Zama. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Pumla. I really appreciate uh, the gift. And thank you to my panelists as well. I'm no behavioral ecologist or a behavioral expert, uh, but I do know how to say hello in terms of uh, like a little pant hoot just to say hello. Uh, Ooh, 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 
Uh, so great insights. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Donald from the Jane Goodall Institute Goods and Shoots Program. And I think from our experience, from my experience, um, I think it's a combination of all of uh, those those uh, um, things, you know, Palindus has said. Uh, first and foremost, it comes to accessibility to knowledge. Um, but accessibility isn't enough. It also comes down to understandability, being able to make that knowledge accessible, but make sure that individuals, specifically youth, understand um, what, what, what they're learning about, break down those complex uh, concepts into relatable everyday experiences, which is the greatest thing I think we, we've we lost sight of as, as people, is that uh, when I grew up, you know, when I was much younger, um, we, the, the teachers would tell me, you know, we're becoming a global village. Now it feels like we're more of a global house, even though we're in different rooms with different furnishings and different things. Um, you know, with so much more connected because of this technology, because of all these things, but the context is still slightly different, which is what is important. And for us, this is what we've seen works, is making knowledge accessible, particularly environmental knowledge accessible to the youth, and then making it understandable to the context in which the youth live in. Um, which is the most important. You know, you can speak about global warming all you want, but if the youth in, in the township of, the township of Deep Slit, you know, they see it on the textbook, they see it in their pages, the teachers talk about it, they see it on the TV with the big men making their policies and signing their papers and they um, but for them, it's not as relatable. Um, but for them, they're sitting in a zinc classroom, an iron sheet zinc classroom, um, and it's boiling outside and they can't focus because now they're in an oven when it's raining, they're freezing cold and can't hear the teacher. Um, it's just those little changes, little, little adaptations, which we found really work to engage youth in, in, in environmental topics, um, making it relatable to them, to their everyday needs. Um, and then taking it a step further, engaging them in actions that actually make a difference so they can see it. Um, and, th and that's what Roots and Shoots does. So Roots and Shoots engages young people, gives them all the knowledge available about the particular topic, um, makes it relatable to their community, to their school, to their group. Um, and then we, we take a step further and say, great, now that we understand how all of this impacts us, what are we going to do about it? What are our next steps? And making sure the youth engage and lead those processes from an early age, from young ages, getting them to understand, okay, community map mapping their community, mapping the, the issues they face, mapping the positives as well. Um, and then identifying those issues and saying, these are possible solutions I think that might work. Um, and then out of that, getting a group together and saying, great, let's try implement. And this is where us as facilitators and educators come in to facilitate, but the, the, the youth lead. And through that leading, you unlock, you unlock all that curiosity where you get that hands-on because, okay, now they have the knowledge. Now they understand how it affects them. Um, now they're more curious. They want to know more. They want to engage. Um, and the fact that they're hands-on makes youth feel more of a community. They make them feel more involved um, in, uh, in, in the process. Um, and thus they can understand, you know, environmental topics and, and they can engage with you more and more. Um, I keep thinking back, it's a, it's a story from, from, from when I first, first started uh, as a coordinator. We were with a, a school, a group of young school girls and we we're talking about, you know, Dr. Jane Goodall, her work. Um, and a young girl put up a hand. She says, I, I love Dr. Jane Goodall. I, I love her work with chimps. Um, I love the Rooster Shoes program. I know her very well. But I also love Greta Thunberg. You know, I think she's really cool. And she's just like me which is another important aspect is that youth leading, youth seeing youth leading into those environments on those topics makes them more interested. Um, I mean, when we talk about technology, um, remember that youth of today live in a slightly different reality to, to, what, to what we live in. They're so inundated with so much information. Um, so the greatest influence you can have on, on youth is other youth other peers and seeing them being involved and seeing them participating, um, that's what makes a big difference. And that's what we try to achieve um, here at the Jacob Law Institute, here at Bruce Institutes. Thank you.
Thank you, Zama. That's really fantastic work you guys are doing. And I, I really like the point about making the work relatable, the work that you do with the youth relatable. And I'd imagine this gives them a sense of ownership as well, which I think is very important in engaging, engaging them. Um, so thank you uh, to our panelists for all your insights. Um, um, to our audience members, please can we get the discussion going in the chat with uh, any questions that you may have. And we're going to start off our Q&A session with some questions that we received ahead of time from our Eventbrite platform. And the first question is to um, Otsile. Um, Ozile, what type of activities do you think can be done to mobilize the youth with a zero budget? <laughs> the toughest <laughs> question out there. Um, well, I think break them down into two categories. Uh, they have to be create for, uh, creative. Sorry, they have to be creative. I mean, anything that is creative usually is low cost to zero and it engages people a lot. You know, people get to be fully invested. If you get young people creative, you're getting them invested in a specific process. The second, uh, try to be resourceful. I, really, that's the best I can give because the reality is we live in a world where everything has a literal cost to it. And so being yeah. resourceful with limited resources that you have at your, uh, of, at your, that you have at your um, accessibility uh, or access to, that is really where you should be looking. So uh, at so at Sundial Movement, we have zero funds whatsoever. So I can speak from experience when I say, you know, building collaborations with institutions or organizations that already are interested in doing something climate related or environmental related in areas like artivism. So like creative art expression, expression around climate and the environment. Those are just areas where you can focus your attention. We at Sundal had, I think it was four of our schools where we had uh, during September, 2022, we had people make paintings and make posters about how they feel about the environment and the climate. And that was a very good segue into, you know, so this is how you feel, you know, let's have a conversation, let's unpack this, you know, how, what, yeah. what is climate? How do you find it? How does it relate to you? You know, uh, the, the whole premise of that being, you know, create a space that is owned by young people where they can be expressive and creative and then have that conversation that they own themselves, that they are the ones leading and they're the ones championing, you know. Sundal is entirely led by high schoolers, I, I might add, even though I co-founded it and I'm not in high school anymore. They accept me, I'm an honorary high schooler, should I? Um, above and beyond that, social media, you know, uh, we can get into the digital divide <laughs> at a later stage, but, you know, for the, for, the, for the time being, you know, social media is one of the most powerful tools actually catalyzing serious conversations around climate you know i say to the sundial team we have a three-step method that we need to implement we need to conscientize so we need to get people conscious about what's happening and we can do that through social media you know tiktok instagram those are the most valuable platforms for gen z to engage yeah. us on climate and it doesn't cost you anything to do it there you know just post if you have a lot of followers that's even better so post 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 so we conscientize people on social media. Then thereafter, we can try organize, you know. Organizing is pretty much the best way to actually get a physical, in-person experience with people to see if they're actually getting it. And most cases, that doesn't cost you anything, you know. So just getting people together, it can be at a school hall, it can be um, in um, a public park. We've done it in public parks before. Uh, you just get people together, organize, and then you can all come together, get like a basic understanding of where you're all at. And finally, that's the last point towards mobilizing, you know, because we have, yeah. we've informed people, we've organized people. Now we need to mobilize for a specific cause, you know, and clean up initiatives in your community. So starting at a very community grassroots level, cleaning up uh, local river streams, uh, local parks, lo your, your local infrastructure around you that is that, that, that makes a day-to-day -day difference in people's lives, but also is related to the environment. You know, that doesn't cost you anything. Getting people out there, getting people to do that, it's very valuable. And you'll even find that local businesses are even willing to sponsor the bags that you put the rubbish in, you know, separate the waste, please, but the bags that you put the rubbish in. And, and so, you know, those are just a few of the ideas that we at Sundial have explored in getting people more involved. And it doesn't have to cost you that much. 
Thanks, Otsile. I think that's fantastic. And I know that's something that Roots and Shoots also does, hey, some other cleanups. And yeah, it's a great way to get young people involved in their own communities. Um, the next question is for Eliza. Um, how do you think we can make it fun and interesting for youth participants? Oh, thank you. Yes, so uh, I was actually going to, uh, Otto Zama was saying about, uh, I think something about being uh, young enough or understanding youth, I'm not sure. Uh, it struck me that and I, I always wanted to use humor uh, because I like making people laugh. And it becomes harder as you age out of the current <laughs> generation to just use humor because they don't get it. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I, I can't reference the right uh, pop culture. Uh, yeah. it's, it's just not there. Um, so now I do other things. <laughs> okay, yeah, I do uh, do embarrassing things. I have no fear of um, embarrassing myself. And I think that, that it is something that people in general need to, in the first place, let go of. So if you want to have fun and engage people, you cannot have the barrier between you and them saying, oh, I'm the professor, and professors act in a certain way. You mm -hmm. must allow them to see your natural self, uh, which for me is actually, I'm just lucky, my personality, it, it, I'm, I can do that easily. I think some of us are much more comfortable having the distance, like it's not... It's a safe space there. Mm -hmm. um, but this is actually where people can start relating to you and where fun starts to happen. I think competition, oddly enough, but competition is a fantastic way of getting uh, more fun started because we are all inherently competitive since we are animals, you know, we are the survival of the fittest. So any kind of competition, competitive, slight competitive element really uh, adds, adds value to a classroom activity to an outdoors activity and doesn't have to cost a lot of money also um mm. i i just buy smarties or things like that and you know <laughs> i i have i have a snack drawer which i do not snack on that much but <laughs> and i use this and occasionally the students really surprise me with the competitions and uh, you know everybody gets surprised instead of just one person but the competitive element most definitely makes a big difference um it engages people just instinctively uh and if you struggle with ideas google it this is this is again using mm -hmm. technology to your advantage if you wanted to teach somebody about x thing in nature somebody else has already tried teaching somebody about that and there are yeah. people with good ideas and i've stolen so many fantastic ideas from other educators, right? Um, and then I just adapt it slightly to make it work. And it might fail miserably the first time, but I, I view it as an experiment. If, if X doesn't work, try Y the next time around. Mm -hmm. So then I don't beat myself up about it. Um, what I was just thinking of as everybody was talking here is when I Google things, it's always from a Western perspective that you get the answers, the options, the solution. We do not have resources. Like I, I, I have to either think very creatively to try and put it in a local context, uh, but I'm surely not the only one. I, the people on this panel are all doing it. Uh, and then we are the tip of the iceberg, probably, right? So we should perhaps be creating some resources. You know, there, there's, there's room there for creating some of these local resources. How do you teach this? How do you do that? What are, you know, what are good anecdotes and things, you know, tips and tricks? But that's for a later, later stage. Thanks. Um, and just out of interest, do you find, you know, in the digital age and we hear that concentration spans are getting shorter and shorter, do you find that you have to be more and more creative, like in your teaching years, have to be more and more creative to engage your students? Yes, but honestly, what bothers me more is when I teach myself asleep. So when I get bored with what's coming out of my mouth, then I know, oh, holy cow, these kids are just polite. Yeah. So, so yes, you, you, you need to be creative, but you put the onus on the students to do something, to try and figure something out, to mm -hmm. uh, literally, I mean, I make them sometimes run around the classroom to 
pretend that they're foragers in the wild. <laughs> and it, 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 it works, it sometimes fails. But yes, it, 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 yeah, the failure is scary. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and then our next question for Zama. Um, which aspects spark interest in young people concerning sustainable environmental action? You're still muted, Zama. Okay. I think my age is starting to show. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a great question, thanks. Um, and I think for the most part, it's actually been, been answered by, 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 by my two panelists uh, over here. Um, but from, from our records and in our showing, I think there, there are many, many um, things that spark youth. That's, that's, that's the one thing. But real world impact. I mean, Otila mentioned the, the, the election that's passed now. I mean, uh, hearing and engaging with youth, we heard a lot of you know negative talk, the pessimism around it. You know, nothing's really going to change. But when you see the real world impact, they not only see policies being made up top, but see the impact down below, then see the impact that they themselves are, are implementing into the world. That that really sparks something within youth to to engage. Um, you know, I had a lot of situations where, you know, it's 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 a small group of two individuals and they're doing a cleanup or they're creating a food garden. And just because they're doing it and they're actually starting to make a difference, other individuals, you know, the boys playing soccer in the corner start to join in before practice um, because they, they, they start to see, okay, this is not just words and 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 and, and talk. There's there's an actual impact. I want to get engaged. Um, uh, personal relevance. I think we've, we've we've mentioned that it needs to be personally relevant to to, to youth of our age, um, particularly with technology. We glue to our screens, but a lot of youth are very inward focused, and I think we need to leverage to that and ensure that um, that that personal relevance sparks them. Um, interactive learning, amazing. It always wins. Um, well, for me, anyway, <laughs> I, I love personalizing. I love what Eliza is doing. Um, and then recognition and reward. Um, if all else fails, like Eliza said, bribery and corruption, recognition and reward, even if it's just a smart, <laughs> will always work. Um, with, with the youth of today, they're so inundated with technology and information, as we've said, um, that there is just a sea of information. Anyone and everyone can share their, their view on TikTok or Instagram, can share their day and can share whatever. But when they're doing something good, and, and especially when it comes to the environment, recognition and reward on an individual and a group level is such a powerful motivator that sparks action. And I think that's what's something amazing that Otsila has been able to accomplish with, with his group, honorary high schooler or not. You know, it's 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 that recognition that we are a part of something that is actually effective. And that's what we've seen really sparks engagement for young people. Mm, that's a good, that's a good point too. Um, and okay, we have a question for the general panel. So anyone is free to, to answer or more than one person um, will be happy. Um, how can businesses build youth capacities to leverage the green movement? <laughs> well, I I'd probably, if I could try this question, um, uh, I, I would start by saying, one, there must be an understanding of the culture, the cultural relationship between young people and business, and in the way we interact with them, especially in issues surrounding sustainability and the environment. So it, it depends on the type of business that you're operating. So if you're doing something that is totally in contradiction to the very principles of sustainable environmental governance, or as corporates call it, ESG these days, you know. Uh, well, I think you should understand that firstly, your actions should speak, your actions on your own, excluding us, should speak louder than whatever initiatives you're trying to run with us. So that's just on a first level. So be cognizant of that before you go into it, because you are finding more and more young people Organizations in the nonprofit space don't want to work with organizations or businesses that are doing things that are principally inconsistent with environmental sustainability, equity, justice, all of those things. 
I'm trying not to go full activist here. I'm realizing I'm in a very calm space. Uh, but then on a secondary level, how you can actually do that practically. So capacity is a very, very big problem amongst youth mobilization and youth, mobili youth mobilizing around the environment at the moment. So if you could do something that helps support capacity, that helps support the ability for grassroots youth movements, youth organizations to be able to, work, to move and work on a much higher level, on a much higher scale, uh, whether it be creating a grant, whether it be creating a program in which ideas can be generated and submitted. And then uh, from there, you, well, it's sort of like a grant anyway, they're what I'm describing, but you can then help them implement it. You can give them the necessary connections or the funding to help implement this project or this idea, you know, something that's engaging, but also something that also helps build capacity, helps build experience and skills amongst the young people in that space already, because we also need to build the capacity for young people within that space to say, you know, this business, XYZ, org, PTYLTG, gave us this amount to run this project, and we did it successfully. And now this project, we want to take it on a much larger scale, help us go further. And you as a business could either connect them to the opportunities to do that, or just by merely giving them the opportunity in the first place, you've opened up the door for them to go further and for them to open doors for more other youth. Because I think we often forget, you open a door for one young person, hopefully, depending on that person, uh, they open up more doors for those that follow. They extend the ladder further. And so it's about accessibility, capacity, opportunity. Thanks for that, Otile. Um, okay. We're gonna have a look at um, some of the questions that have been dropped in the chat. And thank you for the audience members who are dropping questions in the chat. Um, the first question for the panel, how can one adapt to the, how can one adapt to, cooper, to corporate digital world when they are used to being in the field or being more practical? So how can one adapt to the corporate digital world if they're, more used to being in the field, more hands-on. Uh, I was wondering if that question was incorporate the digital word world rather than corporate. Adapt I incorporate digital in, world. Incorporate. <laughs> <laughs> incorporate. Because it's pretty easy. I mean, if you think of incorporating the digital into the field, it is. There's so much happening out there, so much open source technology that's being developed, and it's all things that we can play with ourselves. I mean, I am doing, I heard of some new technology where you can buy very cheaply a, a specific little tool that you then need to weld onto a, a box of some sort, and then you can identify any animal with a chip that runs past it. And it's mm -hmm. cheap. It's not thousands of rands and things like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm almost, almost tempted to buy an iPhone. I don't have an iPhone, but mm -hmm. almost just because I read somebody's uh, thesis in which he used an iPhone to map the burrows of of uh, spot the the, the black-footed cats um, with the iPhone because of the lidar technology that that specific phone has, he can map the three-dimensional shape of underground burrows. And that's to me such a very innovative and great way of incorporating digital technology that mm. is just, it's there uh, to look at the world in a different way. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot, a lot out there that, that can be done. Uh, you need to Google it. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I'd just like to add to that. I think I'm uh, just taking the, the question at face value. How can one who's not used to being in a corporate world, you know, who's in the field all the time, adapt to it? I think we need to take into consideration that if you're in the field most of the time, you view the world much differently than in a corporate space. And I think taking that knowledge from the field and putting it into a corporate space gives so much more value. I mean, we just spoke about creating resources. Uh, individual in the field would be best, you know, would be the one and in, in, in be able to know the best, you know, how to incorporate, you know, what resources actually are needed down. Um, I read an article the other day, you know, that says AI has, has run out of, 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 of material to learn from. I mean, oh. the stories from those in the field, the, 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 the real life experiences of you as an individual who's been in the field, 
going into a corporate space, this is where you could, you know, perhaps fit in and bring your knowledge and thus meld the two worlds together. Mm, thanks, Sam. And also to Eliza's point, there are actually quite a few softwares out there, open source softwares that merge, you know, that digital um aspect with being in the field especially for capturing data you know your eye naturalist earth ranger q field um and they're open source which is really cool um okay the next question from our chat box is how do you see the role of young people evolving in the fight against climate change and environmental degradation um and i take a stab at it sure. um, well I think the evolution is probably going to be where it's at least in the South African space uh, it's going to be that we're going to view climate activism and dealing with climate change as something that is inherently more and more of a political issue because if you look at it at the moment it's not really a very big political issue it didn't feature very largely on the election on, on a list of young people's issues for this election I mean I'll be very honest at so we vote what we did is we actually cataloged all of the issues that young people wanted dealt with in South African politics and climate change scored very very low on that list now we're going to do the exploration as to why that's the case but the way it needs to evolve, it's going to become more of a political issue. It's no longer going to be things we discuss at conferences and sessions purely focused on climate. I think more than that, it's going to be things we bring up at election town halls with our elected officials, more and more with corporates when we get the opportunity to engage. It's going to be an issue that evolves beyond the space because I'm not sure, maybe the others can correct me on this, but the sense I've gotten in the space and the experience that I've had in the space is that climate very often seems to be something discussed in a silo within of itself. It's discussed in silos. It, it, the, the conversation around climate never goes outside of the space of general activism, civic uh, general activism, uh, the intersections between climate and uh, gender-based violence and community-based issues, but beyond that to something that's discussed on a macro level, political level, the same way we talk about ESCOM, even though the way we generate our electricity is inherently related to climate, those discussions never actually happen on a very mass scale. And if they do, it's not done on a level that is accessible or maybe understandable to most people because it's very technical. Yeah, Minister of Electricity say we have to meet this shortfall of 444 megawatts of electricity, which come from this specific station, which runs on coal. Those things shut people off. So I think the evolution is that it's going to need to be more of a political issue and within it's becoming a political issue. Me putting on my so we vote hat there. You begin to see the conversation break in a different way. You begin to see it become less of an expert level conversation, but more of a conversation that relates directly to people and that people can begin to see in their own lives how climate change has already affected them. Like KwaZulu Natal has had how many floods now, which is directly related yeah. to climate change, but that conversation never happens because it's never been something that's been campaigned on in that area on a very big scale, the same way they talk about violence, crime, so on and so forth. So if you follow my long tangent, <laughs> I can see uh, that it has to evolve politically. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll see, I'm a person who has a lot of tabs open in his brain, so you have to follow very attentively. So oh, thanks. No, that's a good point, because you don't hear the link in stories about the floods and tornado you don't hear that link being made and um yeah that would probably be a very good way to mobilize people um would anyone else in the panel like to tackle that one or i i, I agree with Celia, but i also know quite a few people that don't like the word political because we don't like politicians right <laughs> they're like a caricature of humans almost even though they're humans um and uh, I agree that it needs to be discussed you know, in town halls and uh, at ministerial meetings and in uh, science advisories and things like that. But at the core is the fact that it just needs to keep on being discussed and the questions need to keep on being asked in every platform available to you. And that is where, where the youth must also remember it. we're playing a long game here. 
And this is perhaps why, why uh, you know, climate change is like, oh, it's only 50 years from now, even though we're experiencing it right now. Um, it is a long game. And you're not going to affect change by saying, oh, this is wrong. And then you move on with your life. You've got to say, this is wrong. You've got to say it here. You've got to say it there. You've got to say it there. And then you've got to say, this is the right way over and over again. And this is, you have stamina. They don't have the, um, what's the word? They want things now. <laughs> I remember that feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and this verification. Is, this, yeah, right. But they need to take, take this on and, and help with this long game because the older ones among us are talking about it. They need to keep adding to that boiler, mm. keep doing it. And this is how we're going to push the boulder up that hill or, you know, push that door open. Mm. And they will inherit all these consequences of, of climate change. Essentially, it, it'll be theirs to, to bear that brunt. Um, thanks, Eliza. Uh, the next question, what message would you like to leave with young listeners who are eager to get involved in environmental conservation. I think, yeah, I was gonna say that, but you've been quiet. <laughs> I'll take a crack at it. But um, I think the most important message is that you can make a difference. It, it's that simple. And and you just, and it's not that you need an amountable amount of resources. Um, you can make the simplest of, 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 of a difference that will roll on and to make a huge impact. So get involved. Um, you know, start something and, and be okay with failing because that's where we learn. That's one of the most important thing. Be okay with failing and, you know, be creative. Think outside the box. Think about the ingenuity. Um, so I think that's the message uh, I leave is just be brave um, and, and get involved and be okay with with, with failing and, and you don't need what you think you need to get started <laughs> you can just start it's what we tell our groups all the time you know no we need to buy seedlings and then we need soil and we need this to, to so you can have a food growth no you don't you know you eat at home every day you have a sprouting potato in the cupboard you have you know a bunch of seeds from your bell pepper that you have those can become plants, those become seedlings, you know, plant them, grow them, you know, be ingenuitive and just get started. Um, and you'll be really surprised at the support and and, and the difference you can make. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Oma. Um, thank you to our audience for those uh, really insightful questions. So we have just a few minutes remaining um, for today's webinar. So it's time for us to start wrapping up. Um, I'd like to express my gratitude to our um, panelists today, Otsile Nkadimeng, Eliza LaRue, and Zama Ngomane. Thank you for your valuable input and significant contributions to this conversation. Um, thank you. It was a really great um, con conversation today. Um, the next OGRC Tipping Points webinar is scheduled for the 25th of July, and we'll be discussing how we can open up more opportunities for women in conservation. So this is ahead of um, our August Women's Month. Um, please also sign up. <laughs> please also sign up for the OGRC quarterly newsletter to stay updated on future events. We can you can find out um, more about this in the links in the chat. Um, please, and then also for those who have missed um, part of this webinar or wish to revisit it, a recording of the webinar will be uploaded onto the OGRC um, YouTube channel, um, and a summary will also be available on the OGRC website. Again, thank you all for your participation. We look forward to welcoming you to our next um, Tipping Points next month in July. Goodbye. <laughs>